Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, we'd just like to present on a uh, project we've been working on, combining a bit of open data and Python. Um, so, uh, Andre is going to present with me and another colleague of ours who can't be with us today, unfortunately. She's been contributing as well. So, we all work for a company called HAL24K, which operates in, it's working on smart cities problems. So, anyway. Um, yeah, I tried to, yeah. I was hoping the microphone would help. But <laughs> so, um, is that better? Yeah. So, the, so since we're in London, the, the top five causes of death in London were published in 2012 um, in quite a lot of detail for all the boroughs of London. Um, and you might be surprised to hear that uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease appeared in the top five uh, for both male and female uh, causes of death. Um, and whilst there may be different reasons for this, uh, you might be surprised to hear that uh, it could have been air pollution that's contributing to uh, dementia as a cause of death. Um, so our attention was drawn to a couple of articles and papers towards the end of last year, beginning of this year. Um, you can look them up. There's a good one there. I've got a, posted the link at the bottom uh, showing that there's, there's a, some kind of link between traffic-related uh, pollutants and cognitive decline in both the, the um, so brain development in the young and cognitive de decline in the elderly. Um, so whilst the link between sort of uh, lung disease and so forth and pollutions is quite clear, this, this is quite a relatively new uh, discovery. Um, so a bit of background. So dementia uh, and Alzheimer's disease specifically. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia um, and it's progressive neurodegenerative. So it's been, it's the, the cellular structure of the brain changes. Uh, in, in the case of Alzheimer's, it's this accumulation of plaques. It takes 15 to 20 years. Uh, and after this, you get this, these clinical symptoms, which start with memory issues and lead on, uh, get worse and worse up to death. And death is not easy. It's not quick. It's traumatic. Um, and uh, it's, it, 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 it has a huge impact on the surrounding families. We don't really know, understand the cause of dementia. It's uh, genetic and environmental factors. Um, and I guess the, the only thing we know for sure is that it's, that it's related to old age. So uh, that means that because of changing demographics, uh, this, uh, the global age group of 60 years plus is going to be the biggest age group uh, in 2050. So uh, the burden's going to increase. So it's like this paradox of modern medicine. We live longer and longer, but we do so with more diseases. Um, and I saw a TED talk which kind of illustrated the impact of this. So if you, um, if you look at everybody else in the room and imagine we're all 85, if you can look at two people in the room, one of them will have Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, and if you haven't got dementia, then you're probably going to be a caretaker for one of the others, if you can imagine that. So um, the impact is huge, and it's probably going to it's the biggest killer of the 21st century, um, it's been predicted. Um, so who are we? So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Andre, Esther, myself, we all work for Health 24K, uh, which is operating in the smart city space. So we don't do any work on dementia, but we do look at uh, air quality and emissions as part of our work. So this is, a, this is really a side project. Why are we interested in this? Well, myself, I've got uh, my grandparents on one side, uh, passed, one of them passed away, and one of them still suffering from Alzheimer's. So it may be interested in, in looking at dementia data. Esther studied PhD in neuroscience. And Andre, well, Andre's lived in a lot of polluted cities, so he's, he's well qualified. <laughs> so. Um, um, so how does these articles and papers that have been published, how, how, does, how do pollutants affect the central nervous system? So the general idea is that there's two routes to the brain via the nose, nasal passages, and via the bloodstream. Uh, and it's not, there's a lot of pollutants in the air around us, especially here if you walk outside. Um, but it's the really fine particles, PM 
It's, it stands for particulate matter 2.5, so it's less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter. Uh, to give you an idea of the scale, that's a human hair and a few grains of sand. So the blue particles are, these are like pollen, which is really annoying in summer for some people. And the red are even smaller, so it's yeah, 2.5 microns diameter. There's various ways of classifying these particles, made of lots of different chemicals and materials. Uh, but you can roughly categorize them as human-made and non-human-made. So human-made would be anything from industry, uh, vehicles, cars, lorries, agriculture. Uh, and non-human-made um, or non-anthropogenic would be forest fires, that sort of thing. Uh, there's a few links there if you need to look up and read from uh, DEFRA in the government department. They talk a lot about the particles. Um, so p a component of this PM2.5 is this black carbon, uh, which, so a lot of these particles are from vehicles, diesel um, emissions. And this is, this was a map in 2009 in the UK. So you can see that it's really, it's all about the roads, where the roads are, and it's, this, this is creating up to 30, 40% of the particles. Uh, so seeing this map made us wonder if living in or near a city means you have an increased chance of contracting Alzheimer's disease. So we just went to look at that. Uh, that so that, yeah, just an overview of what, what the talk is about. Uh, so we're just trying to see if we can use open data to, to sort of determine the link between Alzheimer's prevalence and air pollution ourselves. We wanted to, on the way, we discovered a few nice visualization te techniques in Python that Andre's going to talk about. Um, and also, yeah, this is still work in progress, so we're going to discuss some of the sort of hurdles we had and also uh, findings that we've had so far with you. Um, yeah, so we went to collect some data, air quality data in, so we chose the three countries that our, our company is based in because we thought that would be easy. Um, there, it turned out there were quite a few challenges because uh, the data formats are quite different. Um, and the way it's monitored is quite uh, different. We wanted to get cumulative PM2.5 over a lifetime, obviously, but monitoring stations have really only been set up since in the UK since 2009, a decent network, and Netherlands, I think it was 2011, I think. And the, the US, uh, in California, slightly earlier, 1990. But So we chose a five-year period of cumulative PM2.5 particles, um, as, as good as we could get hold of. Uh, so the monitoring stations for PM2.5, they have different uh, densities depending on which area. So you can see that California seems to be well covered with monitoring stations, uh, less so Nevada, although Las Vegas seems to have a monitoring station. It seems to have gone off the scale. So maybe that's why they don't have any monitoring stations in Nevada. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's, that's another reason. Yeah. So yeah, that was just a test to put in there. Thanks. <laughs> so. Um, the Netherlands and the UK. Um, uh, the UK seems to be have a lot of monitoring stations, but they're focused on urban areas, um, cities mainly. But the Netherlands very well covered apparently. Um, and if you zoom in on cities, the story is a bit different. Uh, actually, London and, and Amsterdam are, have a decent number of monitoring stations. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, in London. There's more and more awareness about air quality. So uh, that's why there's a decent monitoring network. San Francisco only appears to have one monitoring station, though, in their network that we belong to the EPA, so kind of more limited coverage there. Um, so, yeah, we've got the air quality data. We wanted to dive into the Alzheimer's prevalence data that we could get hold of. So three countries were um, different years, but as close as we could get. Uh, regional divisions are obviously very different, uh, and the age resolution was quite different. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Andre, and he's going to talk about visualization. Okay. Oh dear, how does this work? Ah, there we go. Um, almost there, okay. Can any, everybody hear me? Cool. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Frank. Hopefully, I will not destroy your computer. Like with Max, I am afraid of Max, because how how do I? Ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
So after this crash course into our data, uh, I thought we could spend the next uh, couple of minutes actually looking into some tools that help us analyze and visualize this data. Um, uh, now, uh, you know, uh, uh, to keep it in the context of uh, the talk, the examples I will be showing to you uh, have to do with uh, the data on Netherlands. Actually, yeah, you can see the mouse there. Excellent. Uh, so the data of the Netherlands, and that's uh, that's what we will be doing. Uh, now, this demo is supposed to be uh, kind of quick so that we have time to talk about the results. So uh, you can go and download this notebook. I uh, put uh, it on GitHub, and the link is in the Slack channel for this talk. So you can go and check it out yourself. This is also my excuse to skip over parts that I deem slightly less interesting and give you a homework. So sorry about that. Um, so yeah, uh, let's uh, also, yeah, the demo is uh, kind of quick, but I included some other resources that you can go to and get more detailed information about how all of this works. So now we can get to it. And so the tool I will be talking about the most is this GeoPandas library, which uh, is uh, a library to help you analyze this geospatial data, so data with some geographical information in it. Uh, in it. Now, as the name suggests, uh, this uh, is supposed to work like pandas. So if you know pandas yourself, a lot of this stuff and a lot of uh, what GeoPandas does will be very familiar to you. So let's look into it. Uh, we import some stuff and set some parameters and uh, we read in the data. Now we read the data from this shapefiles.shp. Now on Friday, if you went to the uh, to the geospatial workshop, they mentioned that it exists, but then they went another way. So this is the this is the shapefile way. So we read the file into this geo data frame. This is the GDF, and the weird word uh, in front of it is Kemente, which is uh, which is how the Dutch call like their counties. Uh, so that's how it's called. Let's just look at uh, the at how it looks like. Uh, so one line per each of these regions, just as we are used to from pandas. And importantly, we have this geometry column, which gives us the borders of uh, each of these regions in this uh, in this uh, polygon object. So to just have an idea how uh, these might look. So this is uh, one of them, uh, just a shape like that. Uh, however, they can be more complicated. Just like this, in this case, you'd be talking about a multi-polygon. So we have like the bigger land mass and an island and even like a hole, like a lake or something like that. Uh, so this is great. Now, another great thing about uh, the geodata frames in general is that they know how to plot themselves. Now, this is similar to uh, the pandas data frames. So if I just call plot, here I can create a map. Uh, actually, how do I make it full screen? No, this is not how I make it full screen. Okay, I will not try to, to do that, but you can probably recognize at least a bit uh, the Netherlands, uh, a simple map divided into these individual uh, counties. Now, the color scheme is debatably horrible, but since this is matplotlib, you can use all the commands and tricks that you do and uh, make, uh, well, a less ugly or more ugly map, but the important thing is uh, freedom, it's all up to you. Uh, so great, this is how our data looks like. Uh, and now let's look at some examples of how uh, GeoPandas can help us uh, analyze it. So the first example that we will be talking about is making these choroplet maps, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, that we will be coloring the individual region by uh, a certain property. Now in this particular example, we will be creating a map of the Alzheimer uh, prevalence or dementia prevalence uh, in the Netherlands. Now this is quite a straightforward task because we have the data. So we read it in uh, into uh, this time pandas data frame from a CSV file. And again, we get for, for each of these counties uh, a lot of information, including the Alzheimer prevalence in person right here. So this is great. Now, in this cell, we uh, perform the usual merge that we are used to from pandas, and we can do the plotting. Now, all of this is what we have already done, with the exception of, uh, of this part, where we, give, where we specify a column that we want to plot. So this is the Alzheimer prevalence, and some other parameters as uh, the color and so on. And lo and behold, we have a map of the Alzheimer prevalence uh, in uh, in the Netherlands. 
Now this is just a demo for the visualizing tool, so we will, uh, Frank will later talk about what all of this means and how to deal with this, but uh, this is our result. So great, we know how to create these kind of maps. Now let's look at another example, namely the spatial joins. Now this is another quite powerful tool that GeoPandas allows you to do. Uh, this is similar to the joins that Pandas does uh, and that we just did, where you pick like two columns that you want to merge on. However, the spatial joins uh, uses uh, the properties of the, uh, of the shape objects, so the polygons and so on, and allows you to, for example, join on all the, uh, all the lines where the regions overlap or the regions where one lies within the other and so on. And we will be using this uh, to create uh, a similar map of the air pollution in the Netherlands. So first we read in all the data. Now for the Netherlands, this is actually, uh, this is uh, super detailed. So this is how it looks like. Uh, you can probably recognize well the Netherlands, some of the road network. This actually is based on a simulation, but the simulation comes from the actual measurements. And this is essentially just a NumPy matrix, which gives you a resolution of one by one kilometer. And each of these small regions, uh, uh, for each of these small regions, then you have the value of the, of the air pollution. So the PM 2.5, the particulate matter that Frank was mentioning. Uh, so the first thing that we need to do here is to, well, assign the geographical coordinates to each of these. Like I said, this is just a, a NumPy array. Uh, so this is, this is done in this cell and actually it's not that important for this demo. So again, you can go and check what is done, your, uh, what is done here yourself. I try to comment it in a reasonable way. Uh, but on the other end, we get another geodata frame here, PM geodata frame, so particulate matter, that looks like this. So now you have points in the geometry column. The coordinates, uh, the numbers there are the coordinates in this... Uh, Dutch specific coordinate system, but you can easily transform it into latitude and longitude if you want. But for each of these points, which is the center of uh, each of the one by one uh, kilometer regions, you have uh, the PM 2.5 value. So excellent. This allows us to perform the spatial join, which we are doing uh, right here. And this is how it looks like. It's uh, very similar to the, to the pandas merge that we are used to. Uh, we are merging the, the, this air quality and the regional geodata frame. And ex how exactly are we doing it? Well, we want to join everywhere where the air quality measurement uh, lies within one of the counties. So uh, this is how it works. Actually, this is just a part of the job because this uh, then essentially gives you a lot of individual measurements for each of these counties. But uh, in this line, we just take the mean per each county and we are, uh, we are left with this kind of uh, data where for each of these county codes, in this case, uh, you have the average measurements of the air pollution. And so just like before, you can merge it back into the original geodata frame. So we've already seen all of this at the very beginning. And now we've uh, created this new column PM 2.5 or PM 25 in this case, but it's 2.5. And just as before, we can plot it. And here we are, uh, the map of the average air pollution or PM 2.5 in, uh, in the Netherlands. Again, Frank will tell you what all of this means. Now, the, uh, the notebook continues a bit more, and again, I encourage you to download it and go through it. I will kind of stop here so we can actually talk about some of the results. Uh, it talks about uh, how to turn into this static kind of figures from Matplotlib into something a bit uh, more interactive. Uh, so it talks about uh, examples of three libraries. One of them is MPL leaflet, which allows you to quickly export the map uh, into a leaflet style map uh, and you can get something like this you can zoom in zoom out and so on it talks about folium which allows you to create something similar and also you can have these like pop-ups so when you click on a Hemente or well in one of these regions you get uh, the actual value and also there is an example of bokeh uh, which many people already talked about which among other things gives you uh, the power of this uh, hover tool. So when I point somewhere, it gives me the name of the region and the measurement uh, 
again. Uh, so this much for uh, the demo and handing off back to Frank. Uh, and yeah, deal with your computer and touching it. Uh, I hope. Slowly. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Audrey. So, yeah, thanks for the uh, chat about GeoPandas and a bit of bouquet there at the end. Um, so looking at our data, um, as Andre showed, this was the cumulative PM 2.5 count over four years we managed to gather in uh, the Netherlands. As you can see, it's confined, like the, the highest levels are the darkest, and it's confined to sort of the south of the country. And this made us think a bit, uh, looks familiar. Um, and then we found the average wind profile um, in the Netherlands again, and it seems to match very well. So, uh, and I think if I can, da, 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 if I can show you, actually, I oh, forget about that actually. So there is a link there if you want to click, and you can see the effect of wind on PM 2.5 particles in, I think it's in Beijing. So it has a huge impact. So. Perhaps a small tip, if, yeah, if you want to live in a, an area with a cleaner area, choose a place that's quite windy. Um, although in the case of Beijing, it's, uh, the wind can actually blow the pollution into the city at times. So it may have a negative effect. So we then looked at dementia prevalence. And this is just straight up dementia prevalence in the country, which the problem with that is... Uh, it's really the same as the age distribution across the country. So this isn't the, a, the median age, it's the, the fraction of the population in each region that's over 65. So you can see that it, it closely matches the, the dementia prevalence, as, you, as you'd expect. So it doesn't really tell us anything useful. Uh, just sort of thing to be careful of. Um, uh, so what you need to do is adjust for age. It's fairly straightforward. I mean, you could Google on how to do it, um, but the the crux of it is just really mapping all of your prevalences in each age range for each uh, region onto a sort of standardized population profile. And you can download examples from the World Health Organization website. So it's just a, a, a you're then able to compare different regions, even if the age distribution is entirely different, uh, uh, sort of on a side by side basis. So if we then so then with the Netherlands data, we, we had the PM 2.5, that's fine. We kind of crudely adjusted the dementia data just using the fact, that, because we didn't know any sort of breakdown of the dementia data itself. We just knew the proportion of people over 65 in that county. Uh, but it didn't really give us anything useful. Um, and we can't see any sort of major patterns emerging. And when we, when we just plot a sort of correlation uh, sorry, a scatter plot. There's no real correlation there, as, as we could see. Um, we had a look at the, the California data. That was in some ways even worse than the Dutch data. Uh, so, uh, so there you've got PM 2.5. But the thing is that, yeah, the monitoring stations in California weren't very evenly spread at all. So we're kind of, and a lot of the counties got missing data as well. Um, also, the dementia prevalence was a bit odd in that it was just for Medicare subscribers. So there was, it was, it's like a severe case of what's known as sample bias. So you've, it doesn't really reflect the underlying population. And plus, we didn't have any detailed age breakdown. Um, so we just knew the proportion over and under 65. Uh, so people who obviously sign up for Medicare are going to be tending to be older and probably more ill than the rest of the population. So it wasn't particularly useful. So yeah, just summarizing the limitations with the Californian and Dutch data there. So we decided to um, uh, just move on and, and have a look at the UK data. So the British data actually was decent resolution. Uh, slight challenge, the UK, we like to define our boundaries very particularly. Um, and so you had the dementia count by parliamentary constituency. And of course, the pollution data was by local authority. 
and uh, in the UK, so we have these very odd, we have like ceremonial counties and different kind of divisions. Um, and, but if you get a chance and you need shapefiles, go to the Ordnance Survey website. They have very good, very easy to understand uh, interface and you can just download all the shapefiles you need uh, if you want to do any kind of geospatial uh, analysis. So here's, here, here's plotting the human-made PM2.5 um, in London, and as, as you'd expect, it's pretty high in the centre, uh, sort of some of the highest levels in the country. Um, and this is cumulative over five years. Uh, and this is by local authority. When we plot dementia prevalence, the, region, the boundaries are completely different. So it's quite hard to compare, but you can sort of get a general gist. Oddly, so that looks like there's less dementia in the centre of London. I'll explain why in a minute. So, um, so live in the centre of London if you want to reduce your chance of dementia, according to this map. Um, this is the, the sort of, we then did, as Andre explained, these geospatial joins. So you can see that that's where we had to get with this sort of overlapping of different regions. Um, so we've got age distribution, age distribution in the UK. So pink is the youngest yeah, and yellow is uh, more elderly. This is median age plotted. It has nothing to do with skin color, obviously. It's just so older people tend to be out in the, in the, pro, in the, um, in the provinces, the youngest in the city. Um, so you can see that that's uh, city, cities are in red, so boroughs and counties in blue. Uh, so this is the dementia count, like a profile across all the age ranges. It looks like there's more dementia in the countryside than in the city. But when you do age correction, it brings them nicely overlapping. So the tail off in the, in the distribution there is obviously the life expectancy is about 83 in this country. So that's why it tails off. Um, we did age correction in London as well. Uh, so dementia seems to map very closely to the age uh, again. Uh, so that's why there was very low incidence of dementia in the center of London. Uh, but the, when you correct for age, that's what London looks like in terms of dementia prevalence. So quite heavy on the west side of London. Um, and then looking at PM 2.5, uh, so this is non-human made on the left. Uh, human made seems to match again quite closely to the wind profile. So dark areas on the map on the left are the wind profile. So the highest wind in, in the in the province it's so far out in Cornwall, in Wales, in Scotland. But uh, then there's very high levels around the cities. So plotting age-adjusted dementia prevalence for the whole of England. Uh, it shows that there's not much of a pattern. Okay, so um, plotting a scatter plot again doesn't show much correlation between the two. Uh, so we kind of step back a bit. Uh, who, you know, diesel was really only got popular in 1990 onwards. Um, so which age group is, is the most affected is probably people uh, from 25 to 40. So probably most of the people in this room so you've been affected by the, by the most amount of PM10, PM2.5, sorry. PM2.5 levels are luckily on the decline, but the biggest peak was 1990. So anybody living through that period has basically experienced as much PM2.5 as we're ever going to get uh, in one go, basically. So, and you can see the different regulations have come in and, and reduced these by heavy good vehicles, for example. Diesel soon will follow. Diesel cars will be regulated probably um, with congestion charges. Um, so if we focus on the age range only, which is, which is going to have been most affected by diesel emissions. Yeah, I've, got a, I've only got one minute left, so I have very quick. <laughs> so yeah, we did spot a correlation. Uh, and so where there was very low PM 2.5, um, there were uh, cases of zero dementia in young people. But as soon as you get above a certain level of emissions, you start, there are no cases of zero uh, cases of dementia in, in each region. Uh, so this, yeah, so that was our main finding and that's plotted on a map so you can see it's more focused in urban areas. This is just the young prevalence of dementia. Um, other things we need to consider, confounders, covariates. I don't have time to go through them here but this is like percentage not born in the UK. This is median household income which has, uh, income has an effect um, in terms of your um, chance of getting dementia. So we, we did a random forest regressor model and a whole lot of uh, features came out. 
biggest importance was things like education uh, and percent not born in the UK. Uh, so quick conclusions. We think there's some indication there's a link between uh, cumulative PM2.5 and out early Alzheimer's prevalence, so aged between 30 and 40 in, in that region. But they may be confounded. Maybe we've got it wrong because we're not epidemiologists. We're just exploring the open data. But based on what we've seen, we think that. Um, just to say it's quite a challenge to compare open data from different domains, different geographies. Have a go with geopandas if you can. And where should data scientists live? I think I have to finish now. <laughs> if possibly a windy place or rainy, because rain actually clears away all the particles as well. Not too much traffic. If you have to live in London, then try to hang out in green areas as much as possible. There are a lot of green areas in London, luckily. Um, and get decent sleep, eat healthily, get regular exercise, and, and just keep learning. So that's, well, that's apparently reduces your chance of dementia. So that's it. Thank you very much. Questions? So my question, thank, thank you for the talk first. Uh, my question is, is it not possible that instead of PM 2.5, it's actually noise from the traffic uh, yeah. contributing to? Okay, so so uh, the question is, is it could it be noise and not PM 2.5 alone that's causing dementia? Yeah, somebody mentioned to me yesterday about noise pollution, so I was really intrigued. But that's the first the first I've heard about it. So. Um, yeah, I'll be interested to chat afterwards if you have any articles. Um, yeah, it's an interesting suggestion. I hadn't thought about it. So. Can I just ask for that quickly? Sure. Um, because what you're saying from like the wind patterns and the rain patterns actually influence it as well. Yeah. That suggests it couldn't be something like noise pollution. That wouldn't be affected by the wind and the rain. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay, so just to saying that if it's if uh, wind is having an impact, then it means it must be something like PM two point five is what you're saying, yeah, and not noise. Yeah, well, the thing is, we focused on London a bit at the end because uh, the wind levels are relatively low, um, so it took wind out of the equation more or less. Um, and plus, we're looking at cumulative over five years, so wind effects day to day are relatively minimised. Um, so we can't be sure if it's not noise. I don't know. We hadn't we hadn't included that. Um, I don't know whether how you can measure cumulative noise over a lifetime. It's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> you, you said you saw some link with early onset for, for younger people, um, but if you're looking in central London for, for young people. What, do we know what proportion of those will have lived in London for all of their life or a substantial part of their life? Yeah, so huge confounding factors with, with young people coming in and moving around. That's just age. Yes, so that's, that's another good question about uh, confounding factors. So obviously in London, a lot of people move around frequently. Um, yes, so uh, we, it, it was really, yeah, it's really hard to deal with that. Uh, we found... Um, UK government has got listed a lot of movement statistics between regions, so you could do a really detailed and thorough analysis because you can it logs whenever people move from one region to another, uh, at least for the last I think five or ten years. So we could have started going into that detail, but what we saw was actually if you saw the plot, um, I think, so it's going. So you know, young people tend to live in the centre of London and then move out. So that would kind of match here because you've got areas surrounding London with a, with a higher young dementia prevalence. But you don't get that out in Cornwall and Devon and, or up in the north of England, for example. So maybe that would explain the movement of people. So, and you do get a slight dip in, in the dementia right in the centre of London as well. So maybe it explains this movement outwards. But yeah, you're right. We should really include that in a thorough analysis. Sorry, yeah. I basically got all the pollution. If this is like, if there is an actual proper link, but I was born elsewhere, which was also polluted, so either way, I'm not, I'm doomed. So that's the bad news. The good news, is, uh, I suppose, I would like to hear if we were a group of policymakers who 
UK or other countries, what would you sort of suggest the next sort of step to take um, in like what would be the number one concern? Okay, so the gentleman is, is uh, mentioning that he's probably had a very high exposure to PM 2.5, given his age and where he's lived. Um, in terms of policy recommendations, well, the government is being asked to produce a strategy for air quality. They tried to get out of it and move it to after the election, but they've been asked to do it before now, I think. That was a, a court ruling. Um, I think things like diesel cars, because they're e easy to deal with, diesel scrappage scheme is a good idea. So people who live in a very polluted area, they should be incentivized to get rid of their cars. Ideally, give everybody a Tesla, right? But I don't know whether that might be a bit expensive. Um, move yeah, move to Norway is another idea. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I think trying to target the sources of the particles is a good first step. stratification by age brackets. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's worthwhile to also stratify by education brackets as well. Because you mentioned that, and I saw an excellent TED talk that, that the focus was to avoid Alzheimer, which is, uh, you know, um, practice the muscles in your brain. Yeah, so, yeah, so the question is about uh, impact of education and intellectual stimulation. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, it's a, apparently it's a big factor, uh, more than genetic uh, factors. So, I guess coming to Conferences like PyData and uh, you know trying to push your own learning is, is obviously going to help. So, and in terms of our data set, yes, uh, that's the next step is to bring in education level and and there is a lot of data for that actually. So, certainly we found a lot for the London wards and we'll try and find the same for the country. Yeah, the think. question is if there's still going to be signal for P25 after you strike for education. That's a good question. I'll I well, we'll we can um, we can stay in touch and let you know if you like. Yeah.